always sorry navigating home ownership the path to owning a home um I always like to uh, start talking a little bit about where our stories begin and as respect for um, Memorial Day, which I hope everyone enjoyed family time with Memorial Day. Uh, but I love the fact that we do get to have family time and spend it with our kids, but I don't want us to forget why we have that time. And freedom isn't free. And so this is Donald Schriever, which is my grandfather. He fought in World War II and he came back from World War II. And as I knew him as a child in Waco, Texas, he was a high school teacher. He taught Latin, he taught English, he taught history, he had several classes that he taught. And you know, I was uh, born in Dallas and raised in Texas. And my mom is from Marlin, Texas. She puts four syllables or five syllables in the word ice, right? So when I would spend time with my grandparents, my grandfather, I would say uh, he was very particular. He was from Massachusetts. Uh, he, he met my grandmother there. He's very specific about English, right? So I was the kid that was dangling a participle or two. And he was very specific about, and I can tell that Denise is cringing because she used to be a teacher. So uh, I would end my sentences with prepositions and I would say y'all and fixin and my, my grandfather would call my dad and say, you're raising, you know, not so smart kids. I don't want to tell you what he actually said. But anyway, I just want to say thank you to the veterans and all the things that they do to be able to provide us. That's why we're able to do, have, you know, home ownership and all that kind of stuff. Does anybody else have a veteran in their life or is a veteran? Then we have to thank the Navy. Yeah, I was raised by a couple of Navy officers, and my son is in the Navy Reserves right now, so awesome. I'm surrounded by it. Yeah, we have several family members that are veterans. Okay. You come across a Zoom user. Who are you? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm Ashley Bishop. I, I couldn't get my regular login to work, so I just had to create one real fast. <laughs> oh, that's great. Okay. Well, thank you, Ashley. That's good. So this next thing I always share is, by wisdom, a house is built, and by understanding, it is established. And this was the house that I was raised in in Arlington, Texas, that my parents rented my childhood home for 19 years, 19 years. And I can just tell you that we base that on today's money and the situation today. And that's about four hundred and ninety seven thousand dollars um, just in rent. And so what we try to encourage is if you have home ownership. It is an opportunity to build equity in America and have that home ownership. And I know that my parents went on for several years, leased other properties, and they finally purchased a home very late in life. And I always want to say that in our previous calls this year, we've had a couple of people ask us that question is if they're too old to purchase a home. And the answer to that question is absolutely not. You're not too old to purchase a home. We cannot discriminate based on age, race, color, creed, any of that. And so we cannot discriminate and we don't know how long you're going to live. And my mom is 83 years old and I think she's going to outlive us all. So that is one of the things I like to share is that picture. I would tell my my young self, I would tell lots of things about that big tree in the yard. And this is how the house looks today for realtor.com. It's not exactly how it looked when I was raised in it. And this is the bathroom that I shared with my brother. If anybody ever had share a room, uh, share a bathroom with their brother or with a sibling. I just love the green tile, right? And that's exactly how it is now. I know Kevin and, and Cheryl, y'all are building a house. Y'all picked green tile, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no um, way. <laughs> uh, my younger self, what I would say. Um, this is my life outside of mortgage. I know Ben uh, just talked about it. He's also my husband. And uh, this is our daughter, Landry, and then his son, Zach. And we always provide a disclaimer. The disclaimer is simply this. We work with a lot of people, insurance people, title companies, real estate agents, of course, real estate agents. I don't know if there's any real estate agents on the call today, but we work with a lot of those people to make a transaction come together, builders, all that kind of stuff to make the transaction come together. So we always say disclaimer, like we're responsible for the loan side. That's what we say. Our team, we have all of these licenses and also all this different experience, you know, and a lot of us came from successful careers when we before we came into mortgage. I had done a, a successful sales and marketing career and 20 some years ago decided to, you know, join the mortgage business. And Ben was a successful underwriter and he talked too much. And so they put him in sales and became on the loan officer side. And as I mentioned, 
Denise was also successful as a teacher for many, many years. And then Kelly Campbell has been with our company about eight years and she was in our appraisal department. So now she's on our team. And I think I saw Amber on here too. So post closing, um, we're about to, the voting's about to start for Vested in County. Um, Kevin, I'm going to have you vote. I'm just going to send you a tell you right now. So the investing in your future, these are the discussion topics that we're going to talk about. Should I consider buying a home? Am I able to buy a home? How do I get started? Uh, the path from loan application to home ownership. Um, the, uh, essentially, it's like an investment in the future um, for yourself and for the process. I think sometimes as loan officers, I think we talk fast and because we do this every day. And this class just gives us an opportunity to kind of slow down and really kind of examine the different areas of the process. I, and again, if you want to put questions in the chat, we have those monitored, we will help. Rent versus buy, the cost of renting. I kind of gave you the example as the money spent on renting after one, five, 10, and 15 years. Uh, I was giving you my parents' example. And this example, it, it shows like $2,400 a month, you know, over the course of a year, that's just shy of $29,000. But over the course of 15 years, it's $432,000. So if you can put yourself in a home ownership situation, it's definitely going to be a more improved scenario. House prices are double digits in most states. And I will tell you that I've had a lot of conversations with people and I mean this sincerely is there, I know that people want to wait. And I want to tell you that Ben and I had people when the interest rates were three and a half and 4%, we had people that said, I think I'm going to wait till they get a little better. And we were like, no, you know, um, it's the cost of building is not getting any prettier. It's not getting any cheaper, wood, paint, all of those things. That's not going to, you know, that's not going to necessarily improve. But what is fantastic about being in the state of Texas is that our home values are increasing every year. And what's fantastic about that is that this is the place people want to live. It's close. You can get to the East Coast and the West Coast. We hold our values. That's what's important. Am I able, am I eligible to buy a home? We talk about these three factors, credit, down payment, and closing costs, uh, and a debt to income analysis. Let's talk a little bit about credit. These are the factors that affect your credit score. Um, these are very important factors that affect your credit score. Um, I find this, I experience this sometimes with young people. When young people say, oh, um, I only have one thing. I, bought, I just paid one or two things late, you know, no big deal. And late pays there forever. They stay forever. And it is 35% of the credit score is payment history. So I don't want to say, and I'm not saying that if you pay something late in your life, you can't qualify for a mortgage loan. That's not the case. But 35% is payment history. And so we don't want to have late pay. So whatever your debt is, paying it timely and on time. I want to say one thing about mortgage. When you get your mortgage, you will have a, you know, it, the mortgage is due on the first. It is due on the first. And yes, sometimes you can have a grace period, I guess, from the first to the 15th, but it is due on the first. And even if you take that grace, just be mindful of the fact that that should be the exception and not the rule. The mortgage is due on the first. Make sense? So the paying your debts in a timely manner, keeping your account balances low compared to your approved limit. What that means is that if you have a credit card limit and that credit card limit is $500, then you don't want to max that out. Um, so that's very important. You don't want to have your utilization of credit should not be over 33% of your total available credit. A longer credit history can increase your scores. So sometimes we'll talk to people about what's on their credit report and they'll go, oh, I'm just gonna pay it all off or I'm just gonna close my account. You don't want to close accounts. You wanna pay them down. You may even wanna pay the balances to help increase your score, but you don't wanna close the account because if you close the account, you're ending that credit history. And you want good, solid, lengthy, on-time credit history. I think um, a lot of times too, we you know are able to help build other credits. I'm gonna I'm gonna let Ben give an example of what we did with Zach in just a second. Good management of revolving debt, opening new 
credit accounts or credit inquiries. If it says here, if you, it can negatively affect your credit score. It can negatively affect your credit score if you're getting multiple credit pools from different credit in entities. What I mean by that is, is that you went and you were at Target and you applied for a Target credit card. And then you went to purchase a, a car and you got a, a, a car loan. They, they pulled your credit for that. And then you were doing a mortgage. Those all have different codes. They're all different types of credit. And when you pull multiple inquiries, that's what hits your credit. Not the one pull that the mortgage company will have to, it is a hard pull that the mortgage company will have to do. That's not what's going to negatively affect your credit. It's multiple credit pools and multiple different types of credit. You want to give the example, Ben, of how the authorized user and um, helping establish credit for the 18-year-old, which is not 18 anymore, it's 21. Sure, sure. Yeah, it's it's credits. Credit's an interesting thing because you kind of have to have some to get some. So getting that first piece of credit can be tough. Um, and there's several ways you can do it. You, if you have somebody like a parent or a grandmother who has a credit card that they've had for 25 years, they can put you on that card as an authorized user and you'll get the benefit of all their good pay history, their high credit limits and the, and, and the, you know, the length of time they've had the account open. Um, when my son was a senior, he was 18. I bought a truck and I financed it. And even though he, you know, and I had to talk the credit union into it because he had nothing except a social security number, and barely a driver's license. And, uh, but I got them to put him on the truck note. Um, when he came home from uh, being gone for a year in the Navy, he didn't want my help. I don't know where he gets that from. He could do it on his own, but he refinanced that truck into his own name and he had a credit score because he'd been paying that on that thing or I'd been paying on it, but he took it over, you know, but he had a credit score and he was able to get Navy Federal also gave him a credit card but that got him started. So there's, you know, there's, you can also get secured cards where you put up like $500 and they give you a MasterCard or Visa with a $500 limit. And that reports to the credit union and builds or to the credit bureaus and builds your credit just like that. So that's, that's a couple of ways you can kind of get started with your credit. Sometimes when we pull credit, sometimes credit scores are not where they need to be. And sometimes it's not because they've done anything wrong. They just have very thin credit or they only have one account and they need more different, you know, different types of accounts or credit history. And then again, good pay history. Do you know what your, what's on your credit report? This is a way you can check it annually. If you want to take a picture of this slide, this ftc.gov annualcreditreport.com. And that way by checking your credit score or your credit report, then you know what's on it. If there's something derogatory on it, and this is a way to be able to do that annually. How much money do I need for down payment? I get this question every single day, every single day. I've saved this or I have that. And what question that we always ask the first time out of the gate that we ask this question is, I asked Taylor this today, how much of your own money are you planning to use for the purchase of a home? And we ask that question so that we can make sure that you'll have enough cash to close. An FHA type loan requires three and a half percent down payment. A conventional loan, if you're a first time home buyer, you can have a minimum down payment of 3%. Most commonly, it's 5%. Our team is the preferred lender for communities and schools of the Dallas region. And last July, I was doing a presentation in front of a 200, God, I don't remember, 250 people. And I asked the whole room, what was the minimum down payment for a conventional loan? And more than 60% of the room said 20%. And th that's simply not the case. You don't have to have 20% in order to be able to purchase a home. A veteran, if you're a veteran, we love VA loans. And I showed you a picture of my grandfather. We love that. They're 0% down. It's 100% financing. And it is qualified veterans. And it's a great loan. There's no mortgage insurance premium. If you can qualify for a VA loan, we pull the certificate of eligibility. That is something that Kelly does on our team. A USDA loan is for rural property with, with houses on it and rural areas in the Dallas Fort Worth area. So now you've got some rural areas that are like in Sherman, but it used to be like Weatherford was rural and now it's not. So you got to go a little bit further out of any kind of metropolitan area, usually a lot further out to have it be USDA, but it is also 0% down payment. The most common loans that our team does is probably in that somewhat in that order. We probably conventional is first, 
FHA and VA. Closing costs and prepaids. So when you have closing costs, and I know that on this slide, it says a good placeholder holder to keep in mind is about $6,000. It really kind of just depends on your purchase price, what you're purchasing, how much you're buying. Um, but it is important that there these costs have can be paid in three ways. The borrower pays these costs. Sometimes the lender can, can pay some of these costs. It just depends. And sometimes the seller, it's called a seller contribution, where a seller might be able to pay some of these costs. Um, sometimes the seller has an existing survey. And if they have an existing survey, then we don't have to purchase one. A survey for a new for a property is a lot and block drawing and a, the legal description of your property, and it follows the property because that's what ties you know all the title commitment and everything together. You know, closing costs that can be involved when you're purchasing is like I said, lender costs, uh, attorney closing fees, appraisal, title insurance, and reporting fees because we record documents with the county, again, that binds you to the property, such as the deed of trust. We collect in advance on the closing disclosure 12 months of insurance to make sure that the property is insured. And doesn't mean you can't change property insurance or homeowner's insurance, but we will collect that up front. And then we'll collect what's called prepaid, which is your escrow account. An escrow account pays the, the property insurance and the taxes out of the escrow account. So you have a full payment, principal, interest, taxes, and insurance. And again, that talks about things that you can pay outside of closing. When you get a home inspection, uh, Kevin's on this call and he and Cheryl are buying an, a, a new build. Well, even with a new build, when it gets close, you're going to order uh, a, an inspection, a homeowner's inspection, so you can make sure that they've done their due diligence, that the inspector makes sure that everything is wired correctly that you that that you know that they've uh, put insulation in their various things when you're buying an existing property you're making sure that things are functioning correctly electrical a a um hvac items those type of things where will the money come from to purchase a home the most famous question of the day so how many of us would like to just win the lottery can we just do that that'd be great i'm in for that lottery's good that might not happen, so we have to find ways that we would uh, use, utilize to purchase a home. Checking in savings accounts, saving your own money. Gift funds, so gift funds are great. If you can have gift funds, there's no reason to keep you from purchasing a home because gift funds can help cover down payment. They can help cover closing costs. Gift funds are, are just a, a great source. You can combine gift funds with your funds and a down payment assistance program to be in a position to purchase a home. A lot of people don't realize that 401k, 401k money is, you can utilize 401k. We have a, a loan that's closing on Monday and uh, he was able to take money out of his 401k without penalty because you can, when you're purchasing a home, it's kind of a you can do a hardship loan or you can just take it out. You can get a loan against the 401k and pay the money back. As long as it is a 401k, um, you're able to do that. There are other types of pension funds uh, with employers, and you just have to check and see what the rules are and the guidelines for that. Cash value of life insurance. I had a customer that had a small life insurance policy that her parents got for her when she was a baby. It was very small. I think it was under $5,000. But it wasn't accruing, it wasn't increasing in value, and they no longer felt like they needed it, obviously, because she was an adult, and they said, do you want the cash in this life insurance policy, and then you can use it. So she was able to use that, and you were able to use that towards the purchase. Uh, the sale of personal property. Sometimes we have things that are in our garage that maybe our significant other bought, maybe a motorcycle, maybe <laughs> another boat maybe something that they don't actually need and maybe it doesn't get utilized. I, I think the most famous thing I've heard lately was jet skis. You know, they didn't get utilized in the way that they thought they would. So you can sell personal property and use that towards the purchase of your home. We just have to show a bill of sale. We have to show that you owned it, you know, and then the bill of sale and match the deposit with your account. Some employers have assistance programs or some employers will do a match. If they think that you're going to be in a situation where you're closer to home, 
they might be willing to do a match, a grant program, something like that. IRS tax refund um, this time of year. How many of us love taxes? Yay. So uh, on the IRS tax refund, you can get that refund and put that in your account and that uh, and, and in a savings. Don't run to Vegas with the IRS tax refund. And that would be something that you can use towards it. There are several people that we've been working with lately that have a second job. And the second job, we can't show that second job as a source of income, but you can use that money as a source of asset. Put that aside, a uh, little, you know, side, uh, some people call it a side hustle. Also, mortgage credit certificate. If you're a first time home buyer and there, a mortgage credit certificate is not necessarily for down payment, but it does create a tax credit for the time that you own the home as your primary residence. We, I teach a lot on it. I recommend you guys Google what a mortgage credit certificate is. Um, and there's no debt to income ratio of credit score qualification, but it just based on income for the county that you're buying in. It's nice to have a tax credit if you can get it. Down payment assistance programs. We use several state agency programs, but the one we like the most is Texas State Affordable Housing Corporation. I will have uh, Kelly put in the chat, tsahc.org, and you can go to their website. They have like an eligibility quiz that you can fill out. Um, there's a, a lot of really interesting information. We're listed on their site. I teach classes for them on that on behalf, and I serve on the advisory council. Um, and we're having, we're, we're teaching a group of realtors on July 26th in Friendswood, Texas. So it's exciting be able to get more information about this program. Um, but that's one of the programs that we like to utilize. Uh, any questions so far? How are we doing? We're doing good. Uh, no questions at this time. Okay. Uh, do you want to put that t in the um, uh, in the chat? And then also already done. Okay, good. See, there you go. And you, I would also put in the chat um, all of our information, our emails, Ben's, Denise's, everybody. And, and Kelly, if you'll put yours in there and, and remind them that in order to get Blue Bonnet Seeds, they need to email them your address. Their address. Okay, we'll do. Okay. What does it take to waste $10,000 a year? So I had this conversation earlier today before I went and got my teeth clean. Someone said, I just don't know where the money's going to come from. And then I was like, how much money do you spend on fast food? You know, it's kind of a shocker when you think about it. And $27.40 a day in miscellaneous spending equals $10,000. Is that crazy? Does that feel crazy? Yeah, it's kind of a crazy thing. So what I always recommend is people really give some consideration to what they spend. And one of the things like even with uh, with with Ben and I, we have different offices and sometimes we're working in the same office and we make a plan. And sometimes we just pack a lunch, you know, get some bread, get some turkey, get some cheese. Mm -hmm. And I've had many conversations with people where I've asked them, uh, you know, or reviewed a bank statement and said, hey, eating out is very expensive. How many of you think that's really gotten expensive? It's really, really expensive. So sometimes we just have to pack a lunch. And that's the way to save money. Food for thought, so to speak. How much can I afford? So let's talk about the debt to income analysis. Okay, so how much can I afford? Debt to income is, that's the, when you hear somebody say debt ratio, debt to income analysis, that's what the uh, underwriter uses to, to make sure you can afford the, the mortgage payment and all your other bills. Um, so your DTI, your debt to income, is your total monthly debt payments divided by your gross monthly income, including your house payment. And that's the entire house payment, the principal, interest, taxes, and insurance. There's four components to a house payment. And sometimes there's uh, also mortgage insurance in there. Um, so, so example, um, if, you're, if your combined monthly income is eight grand, um, a 45% debt to income, which is kind of a good rule of thumb for conventional. We can't go higher than that, but just base everything on 45% if you're doing this math for yourself. That means your total house payment plus all your debts uh, that go out each month um, and not your electric bill, utilities, but your visas, 
your car loans, your store cards, those kind of debts, any credit union installment loans you have can't equal, can't be more than $3,600. The $3,600 over $8,000 equals 45%. Um, so in this case, they added up all their debts, their credit card payments, and this is your minimum required. If you have a credit card with a $3,000 balance, you're paying a grand every month, but the minimum required payment's only $150, we're only going to hit your ratio with $150 a month. Uh, so the credit card payments are 200, the car payments 300, the student loans are 400. So your total debt's 900. You subtract that 900 from the 3,600, and that leaves you with 2,700. So that's your max house payment, not just your principal interest, but your principal interest, taxes, and insurance. Uh, and that's how you get your debt to income. Now you need, you know, you don't have to be super precise on that, but it's good to know. We're going to we're going to get it in there, massage it for you. And we even have a few tricks we can help you out with. But it's just when somebody says debt to income, this is what they're talking about. And everybody's information is going to be a little bit different. So, for example, my I might have a credit card that the balance is $5,000. And my monthly obligated debt on that card might be $100 that I'm obligated to pay. But Kelly might have the same credit card and her monthly obligated debt might be 150. Her debt to income ratio is going to be higher. So it's monthly obligated debt. And so that's what you have to think about. We just, this is just um, an example of the math. We have loans that we've approved where the debt to income ratio is higher than 45. But as a general rule, we like to leave it or like to have it not exceed 45% if we can. Any questions here? No, good. Are we all good? So um, I know that I've had a lot of questions lately about student loan debt and defer and debt student loan debt that's deferred. So even if the student loan debt is deferred, we still have to account for the debt. And so what we're fortunate with is it used to be like on FHA loans, we would have to hit, hit people with a 1% of whatever the balance of the student loan were, is. And that changed last year. So now it's only half a percent. So it's half a percent of whatever the total balance is. And we've talked about it already, but what's included in my monthly payment? Uh, and again, it says right there, payment due the first, but your principal, your interest, your taxes and insurance. And if you don't have 20%, you have what's called mortgage insurance premium. And so that will also be part of the total monthly payment, principal interest taxes and insurance and mortgage insurance premium. Um, the, the principal, is part of the house. It's the principal of the loan. The interest is for the bank, the interest on what the money costs. The taxes are property taxes. And then the insurance is your homeowner's insurance. We are fortunate that we work with a lot of great homeowner's insurance referral partners. And so they help us be able to get that information so that we put it all together in your total monthly payment. I love this. Taxes. So we, it's very important that you're filing your taxes on time. Start a tax folder. As you're purchasing a home, you're going to want to put some documents in that folder for taxes related to the house. At the first of every year, when you own a home, you're going to get what's called a 1098. And a 1098 is a form that will allow, that, that is the interest on the loan. And that's something for your taxes. And then also the property taxes are something that you want to put in that folder. You want to strategize, you know, tax deferred retirement accounts and talk to a tax expert. Ben and I use uh, Paniter and Associates. They're in South Lake, Texas. And we like Nick, uh, we like Paul and we like Nick Paniter. They're both great. Um, and if they can handle our complicated taxes, they can handle yours. So we, but we, it's sometimes better to consult with a tax professional to be able to get them done correctly. How do I get started? Well, typical items that we need to complete the loan process. First thing we need is a complete loan application. So a lot of times we get loan applications in, Kelly reviews them and it's missing something. So if, if we're waiting, if we're in the loan process and we have a loan approval um, and we're waiting, we're waiting for the house to be built, whatever, we will get updated items when we get closer to closing. But these are the items that we need usually uh, to start with. Pay, current pay stubs over the course of 30 days. We need two years tax returns. Um, if you're uh, W-2s, if you have that or 1099s, 
we, are, we need a photo ID that's not expired and it has your legal name on it. So, um, and we want it to match what the loan application says. We would like that to match. And, uh, but again, it cannot be expired. You're gonna bring a photo ID to closing, to the title company to close on your loan. So it's very important that that photo ID be current. Most, um, the, the most recent two months asset statements for all accounts that we're gonna use to qualify with the assets for the loan. We have a Premier Express program. Um, if we have all of these and also if the property is eligible, if you're putting 20% down and the property is eligible for what's called an appraisal waiver, then it kind of goes in, in and out of the system in pretty much 24, 48 hours. Talk to the loan officer before you do any of the following. This happens. Don't change employment. <laughs> Please don't change employment in the middle of the mortgage process. If you're a month from closing and you just cannot stand your boss, <laughs> learn to live with them. Do not quit. Do not get upset and quit. Are we all good with that? Don't do that. So anybody can tough it out till you close on your loan. I know, Kevin, I can see you're smiling over there. So, you know, don't you be quitting now. Don't do that. I'm retired. <laughs> Significantly increased credit card balances. Please, 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 please wait till you close on your loan. And the loan is funded before you buy a bunch of furniture. And don't increase your credit card uh, balances in the process. Don't reduce asset balances, you know. Sometimes what happens in, in certain families is they decide to loan money to a family member. Please don't do that. We're going to source what your assets are and we want them to remain the same. Also, don't apply for new credit. Once you're in the system and we are ready to uh, get to the closing, we don't want you to apply for new credit because it will send us an alert. So when you apply for new credit, then we have to count that towards your debt to income ratio. So if you are 30, 60, 90 days from closing, we don't want to apply for any new credit at all. Don't make large undocumented deposits. I was getting ready to do a closing and the father-in-law of my client decided to send them a gift of money, which we didn't were not aware of, and they, and then we were maybe a week or so out from closing, needed an updated bank statement and we got it. And in their account was a foreign wire transfer from Colombia. Uh, that did not go great, okay? So we don't want any large undocumented deposits in your account. The other thing is when you go to a closing, uh, when we, we're talking about closing, you're gonna go into a title company to sign your documents to purchase your home. We're gonna wire the loan money there. You're gonna bring either wire or bring your money as a cashier's check. Then you sit at the closing table with an escrow officer and hopefully the loan officer is there. Sometimes realtors are there as well. And when you're all sitting there and we're ready to go in, in that moment, you want to be sure that, you know, like I said, things are not expired and all that kind of stuff. But when you bring your, your money to the table, Ben had a customer that came to closing with a brown sack of cash. 23000 Tell me, tell him what you did when he did that. I said, James, you got to go get a cashier's check. He said, man, if I do that, the IRS will know about this money. I said, yeah, but the title company's not going to take 23000 It was actually in a shoebox, but same was, difference. Sorry, <laughs> I had the brown paper sack person. So, yeah, you can't show up to closing with a, brown, with a shoebox full of cash. Okay, that won't work. We got to document it. Um, you ever, anybody ever heard that phrase, laundering money? No kidding, right? Can't launder money in a mortgage transaction. We're all mortgage backed securities and you know we have to know. You don't want to change banks. I know that people get frustrated sometimes with bank services um, and how they take care of their customers sometimes, but don't change banks before you close. Move money from one account to the other back and forth where it's hard to document it. And the final thing is, please don't co-sign a loan for a family member or anything like that, especially right before closing. Because again, it doesn't matter that they're making, I've heard this all the time. Well, I was just helping out and they're making the payment. It, you still are liable for the debt because you co-signed the, the loan. 
All right. Anything else? Everybody good? Any, all, all, everybody's quiet. Well, it sucks I can't quit my job. <laughs> oh, okay. Don't quit your job. Don't go sign on a line. <laughs> Don't do that. And if you're relocating and you have a job here or job offer, we're going to take the job offer letter. There's those things. Having your own realtor is so important. Is there a realtor on the call? Sometimes there is. So I didn't know if uh, Bianca was or I'm just double checking. So having your own realtor is so important. I cannot say this enough because we've become the age of DIY projects. We cannot be a DIY project when it comes to purchasing a home. Do it yourself, is not gonna work? How many of us would look on YouTube to figure out how to do heart surgery and then do heart surgery on ourselves? Probably not. And you wouldn't wanna do that when you're going into a legal binding contract to purchase a home because it won't, it doesn't serve. You've gotta have some type of help and representation. Real estate agents have the market knowledge. They help you find the perfect home. They have the inside scoop on the latest listings. Sometimes even before if they hit like the MLS, they help you stay objective. They explain each part of the contract. They do the negotiations for you. So they take the emotion out of it and help you with the negotiations. They schedule and guide you through inspections. They communicate with the seller's agent and title company to schedule closing. So we, we don't want to have it be a do-it-yourself kind of thing. A lot of times if we get a contract and there's no realtors on the seller side or the buyer side, as a lender, it's it's challenging because we're having to provide and do advice. And, and, and we don't want to be in that lane. That's not what we're licensed to do. I know recently Denise had a loan in a situation where she was kind of put in, um, you know, just trying to explain something. And we don't want it to, we don't want to be in the lane that we're not licensed and that, you know, they have to be able to figure that out. Does that make sense? From contract to closing to home ownership, you have a purchase contract, loan estimate of initial disclosures. We usually do that within three days of receiving the contract. And while the file is in processing and underwriting, that's when we're baking the loan, I call it. We're baking it because we're waiting on appraisal. We're waiting on a title search. We're setting up hazard insurance. We're locking an interest rate. We're discussing it. And then all of those, you know, that all that takes a little bit of time. It's like a recipe. It's all important. And it doesn't take a long time, but we do take those things together. And then um, the underwriter approves the loan and sometimes approves the loan well in advance. Kevin, you and Cheryl have an approved loan. It's been approved for a while and we're waiting for the, the bill to be finished. And then we can finish baking the loan, if you will, baking the cake um, to get to closing. And then once we have a clear to close, then we send out what's called an initial closing disclosure that you will then e-sign. And then we use that to balance with the title company for the final numbers and figures for cash to close. And we are required by law to do that three days before uh, closing. So a three day prior to, to a business closing. Then there's closing day, closing day, it happens during the day. Title companies are open during the day. So you go and you sign your closing documents. And um, then once you sign and the seller signs, then what we have what is called is funding of the loan. And the, the keys to the house are yours when the loan funds. So just a quick story. I was doing, and I was it was a build situation and we had signed the documents and then I took her to lunch. And while we're at lunch, I got a phone call and the night before closing, she had opened a new credit card account at the, I think at that time it was at the mall. Well, it hit it while, while we were at closing, we got a credit alert about someone that had pulled their credit. These types of things are the reason why I purchased hair dye. Okay. <laughs> so, um, so immediately I talked to her, I'm sitting at lunch with her and I had to find out what did she charge and how much was it? And I had to get a copy of the statement so that I can include the monthly obligated debt on the balance as liabilities. So we don't want to do that the day before. It's very important. Don't go to Lowe's, Home Depot, furniture, none of that stuff. We, we don't want any type of credit alert. So I did a, uh, a podcast with the with t uh, T Texas State Affordable Housing, and it's called On the House. And it was a podcast of about 30 minutes. So if you want to take a picture of that, you can use the QR code at your leisure 
I love this uh, podcast. You can listen to it in the car. And it just talks really more in depth about credit itself. You know, talk a lot about that. And I was interviewed and um, it's a lot of really great questions. We are on YouTube. This class is recorded and it takes a little bit, but then we usually can, uh, takes a couple of days. And then we put the recordings of the class on our YouTube. You can subscribe to the YouTube channel without, uh, there's no fee. It's a free subscription. And there's a lot of different things on there. Any kind of other lessons or things that we've done along the way that's on the on that YouTube. And then we have a great team and we have some core values on our team, faith and family, accountability, integrity, driven, dependable, commitment. Those are our team members. I, Anthony's not on the call because he's in Cancun. Philip is not on the call today because he is a Bible quiz coach and they are in a contest in Beaumont, Texas. So uh, just thought I'd tell you that. I know, right? Beaumont, Texas. Deanna um, is licensed. We're, our team is licensed in Texas, Oklahoma, and Louisiana. So that's our group there. And the last thing I would share with people is that, uh, you know, my, my I mentioned in the beginning of the call, you know, my parents rented my childhood home for 19 years. And I finally was in a position where I could convince them to purchase a home. And they did that. And they uh, purchased a home. I helped them uh, purchase a home in Flower Mound. And this has been a really, really, really long time ago. And I will tell you that the first couple of months that they were in the house, my dad kept saying things like, I think I'm going to, you know, paint the front door of this, or I think I'm going to hang this or that. And I was trying to explain to him, I'm like, dad, it doesn't matter. You can paint the damn thing pink. You know, it's your house. Your name is on the mortgage. I mean, I helped to facilitate it, but it's your house. And that's when I first realized that he had been asking for permission his entire life. And so the sooner that you can put yourself in a position where you own it, then you can do it how you wish. Um, then you don't have to listen to anything next door or downstairs or upstairs if you when you put yourself in a position to own a home. So I, I did that. And then I was visiting like I'm visiting with you guys later. Uh, and this was, again, many years ago. And um, it was the closer it gets to Father's Day, the, the harder it is. But my dad was visiting with me. It was a Saturday and I was talking to him like I'm talking to you now. And 45 minutes later, he passed away. He wasn't sick. He was 61 years old. And I share this story all the time because you're making a life decision. And if I hadn't been in a position to help them purchase that home, my mom working in special education for 70, so she was 75 years old, she would not have been able to purchase that home on her own. They were able to purchase together. Now my dad's money for, from social security is what helps her pay the mortgage. And she is now 83 years old and she still lives in that same house. And we're now going on about 20, almost 20 years. And I share that story because our kids are safer when we own a home and they play in their own yard. Um, and we just really are advocates for home ownership and try to help people navigate the path and there's people that have worked with us for a couple of years before they're able to do it because we just have to strategize. We have to figure out what works the best. And everybody that works on our team, we're here for the long haul, you know, and uh, we're here to hold, we're good hand holders. Let me tell you, we're really good hand holders um, and through, throughout the process. And I talked about the blue bonnets. The reason I started the blue bonnets is because my mom said, every time I speak to someone or a group of people, she said, you always have to give out flowers. And, and I was like, that's not practical, mom. I can't give flowers to everybody I speak to. And she said, yeah, you can, yeah, you can. And I didn't know exactly how I was gonna be able to do that. And that's how I was able to create Blue Bonnet Seeds. So we could all grow together. Um, and again, Kelly would be happy to mail these out to you and get those planted. But I'm telling you that it's not as difficult as it seems. It's a lot of paperwork sometimes. We do have to get documentation. We're definitely working on some loans right now that are closing next week that are, you know, cause us pause, you know, because it's definitely requiring a great deal of effort on our part. And sometimes you don't see what's going on in the background. Um, but I promise you that we won't ask you for a piece of documentation that we don't need because we want less paper. We don't want to ask you for anything that we don't need. If we are asking you for it, 
well, then, then we need it in order to be able to close the mortgage loan. And again, you can reach out to any of us. We like it if you like us. So we are on Facebook and Instagram and LinkedIn and all of us are, you know, and YouTube, like I mentioned that. So we like it if you, if you give us a shout or if you if be, I always tell, be our friend. We would like you to be our friend. So I always put that on there and that's pretty much it. I thank everybody for their time. I was actually kind of surprised there wasn't more questions. So I'm not sure if that's because I was really good or just really fast tonight. Again, we're excited about the summer. There's lots going on. We have an office opening in Friendswood and we have a very successful office in Lovekin. And it's just, I'm in a flower mound and Kelly is doing the drawing. And what we're going to do, we are going to send you one of these, which is a water bottle that we really like. I've heard that people put wine in it. Don't do that, but you can. Um, and so she'll mail one of these with some seeds. So she's going to do the drawing. Do you want to announce it to you? Yes, I'll announce it okay. because I did it, you know, in, with the bowl and paper method this time instead of the spinny wheel. <laughs> okay. Any questions? Does anybody, before we go to any questions? And the winner is Karen Steerman. Karen! Woo-hoo. The whole time. Uh, hey, Karen, congratulations. <laughs> Karen, be sure to um, email me your name and, and address so I can send that to you. Yay. And again, I think that you guys put it in the chat, all of our contact information. Um, so if you have any questions, if you're in Houston, Denise can take care of you. Then, you know, we're all over. doesn't matter where you are. We'll get you taken care of or find someone that can help you in that area. We'll also have really great referral partners with realtors and like I said, insurance companies and title companies. So we're kind of full service in that way. So y'all, we appreciate you. And if you have any questions, like I said, let us know. And uh, we look forward to being part of your journey into home ownership. Are we all good? Thanks, Stacy. All right. Y'all have a great night and a great night. Reach out if you need anything at all. <laughs>